fulfilled. It's a fact that many Christians don't really understand what the law even is. This is due to, yes, again, bad or lack of teaching. Some even think that the Old Testament Ten Commandments are the law. No, with the exception of the Sabbath command, which is the law, all the rest are just instructions for godly living. Not the law. Not at all. The law is the 613 laws that God gave in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, mostly in Leviticus. 613 laws. God knew that no one could even remember all that. So why did he give them? To prove to the Israelites that they could not be righteous of themselves. Breaking even one of these laws put the person under a curse of the law. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. I'm not going to read it all to you, but you should read it for yourself. It lays out the punishments or the curse of the law, which is horrible. And the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy, ahead of that in Deuteronomy 28, tell us of the blessings for obedience, which was rare. It still is, but not because of the law. In Galatians 3, starting in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, Paul says, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? That means witchcraft. That means the deceit of the devil. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? The law is in the flesh, not in the spirit. And also the word says that there is no faith in the law. Think about that. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed, it was in vain. Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith, remember there's no faith in the law, only those who are of faith in Christ are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Notice this is reiterated after it's first stated in Genesis 12 several times. Because it is not Israel he's talking about. He's not saying that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed, which is a statement that is made over and over by people who don't understand. It says, those who bless you, Abraham, in Genesis, those who bless you, Abraham, specifically, will be blessed, and those who curse you, Abraham, will be cursed. So this is about his promise to Abraham, who was a Jew, but now he is the father of the church. Keep listening, and you'll find out. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. He was one of the few believers. That's why God could base his covenant through Abraham. For as many as are of the word of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them so that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Now here's that scripture I referred to before. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, meaning the cross. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And he says, continuing in verse 15, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and that's a capital S on seed, that means Jesus. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as one, and to your seed, who is Christ. We are the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. So the promises that God made to Abraham are now promises that belong to the church. Despite all the other false teachings to the contrary, the law was put to death at the cross. This side of the cross, the law is history. The Pharisees' principal hatred of Jesus was because he rejected the law and therefore their authority. They were absolutely furious about that, and that's why they tried to kill him. That's why they were always trying to harm him in whatever way they could and discredit him. In Acts 6, 12 through 14, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses, false witnesses, people who were lying about them, who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemies, words against this holy place and the law. He spoke against the law. That was the Pharisees' problem with him. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Yes, he changed everything in the Old Covenant. He fulfilled it. That's what he did. And that's what I'm talking about today, that Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't just come and continue it, like most people say, continue to keep it and fulfill it. He fulfilled it, put an end to it. Done. Done deal. In Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, For he himself, Jesus himself, is our peace, meaning our wholeness, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh, focus on that, abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. In other words, from the time Jesus came, it didn't matter to God whether you were Jew or Gentile because his covenant with the Jews was over. It was done. And everyone was on a level playing field. That's what it means, no matter what you've heard other than that, because I know there's a lot of teaching out there that is just off the wall on this subject as well as many others. The one new man means that the Jew and the Gentile are the same in God's sight. The word says that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but we are all one in Christ. This is what most people don't grasp, and you need to. It's, it's important. So he put the law to death, to death in his flesh. He abolished it. He absolutely abolished it. And then in Colossians 2.14, we see that he says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, that's the law, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, having wiped them out, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross, having nailed it to the cross. Those who try to honor the old covenant and its rules and regulations and the law do so by ripping it off the cross 
and bringing it illegally as contraband into the new covenant. This is what you need to grasp because this is not just something that you can overlook because when you touch the law, you are touching a defiling doctrine and defiling yourself. This is what Christ came to deliver us from, to bring us a new covenant, new, replacing the old. Not a continuation of the old, but replacing the old. In Galatians 4, 19 through 21, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? In other words, don't you hear that it's a curse? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one a bondwoman and the other a free woman. And these two were separate and apart. So we have, then we go down to verses 28 through 31, which says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. We're not of the bondwoman, we're of the free woman, the children of promise, the son that God promised to Abraham, who is Isaac. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. It is now. We know this. Look around. You'll see. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And then the first verse of chapter 5 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's what the rules and regulations of the old covenant are. Bondage. And you are not supposed to be in bondage. For Christ came to set you free. Totally free. And there's no bondage in that. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus says, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. His coming fulfilled them. And that's what he was trying to explain to them. Jesus fulfilled the law, put an end to it. When you make your last mortgage payment, that's an end of your mortgage payments. You now own your house. Nobody with any sense goes on paying the mortgage payment after the final payment. Well, Jesus was the final payment. When Jesus came, the blood of Jesus wiped out the law, the old rules and regulations as well. There is nothing left to be fulfilled now. Remember, Jesus put it to death in his flesh and nailed it to the cross. We are not to touch it. Jesus redeemed us from all the old rules and regulations. All of them. He didn't leave any behind. He wanted us to be part of him, part of the new covenant. This is what we have to understand. And unfortunately, that's not what's taught in most churches. In 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 7, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. For we know that the law is only good if it is used lawfully. That's a whole other subject. But then it continues, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. 
And that's what he means when he says we know the law is good if it is used lawfully. Well, in the old covenant, it was used lawfully. In the new covenant, it's used illegally. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, and for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Listen to that. Listen to that. This is what you have to understand in this. The law is for these people. Which one of them are you? If you want to be under the law, which one of these abominable people are you? Well, you're not. And that's the point. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, which is verse 11. So that whole passage from verse 5 through 11 should really explain to you what you're messing with if you touch the law. This is so serious, and the Lord wants us to understand it, but because it's not taught, most Christians go, don't go and dig it out, and they should. In John 8, 31 through 33, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, the Jews who were following him, who were obedient to the old covenant, by their own statements, who said they also wanted to be part of Jesus. So they said they believed him. And he said, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. And they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants. They were indignant and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So they were absolutely insulted, and they continued to argue with Jesus and rebuke him. And then verses 34 through 36, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever commits, whoever, I'm sorry, commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. A son Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. But that was not good enough for them. They considered themselves already free. They didn't want to listen to Jesus. They wouldn't hear his words. And so he said to them, starting in verse 42, you should read this whole chapter because it really, again, gives you a complete picture. Jesus said to them, because they argued with him, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let go of their old traditions, their old laws, they wouldn't follow his words only. And he said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Now understand also, remember, I've taught it constantly, to God, love and obedience are synonymous. So he said, If you were of God, you would love me, you would obey me. Is why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able. You are not able to listen to my word because they were so deceived by the old. You are of your father, Jesus says to these men. Now these were Jews, remember this. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. A liar and the father of it. Now remember when he says he's a murderer, he's referring to the fact that the Pharisees and these men along with them, because he says it earlier in the scriptures, wanted to kill him. And he says, if, if you were of my father, you wouldn't want to kill me. But they tried to kill him, the Pharisees. These men were part of that, and therefore they were of their father, the devil. 
but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is not of God, sorry, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. These are the things that are not taught, but they need to be. If we truly love the Lord, if we are truly part of him, we will believe him. And part of that is cutting off all the old covenant. But these men in this John 8 reference would not let go of their old ways. So they were tied to their father, the devil. And they tried to kill Jesus with the Pharisees because the devil's a murderer. And this is why Jesus spoke to them in this way. All who embrace the law or any other of the devil's lies, known as false doctrine, are tied to the devil. It's so sad that most Christians do not understand this. Emotionally, they love Jesus, but in their practice of the word, they deny him. That Jesus abolished the law in his flesh is clear. And he left it nailed to the cross. The crux of this is to see that Jesus did fulfill the law and put an end to it, a total and utter end to it. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, very familiar scripture, but look at it in this context. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. That's not just in the individual's life. That's referring to the old covenant versus the new covenant. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. I know you've read this scripture many times, but look at it in the context of old and new covenant. Old things have passed away. The full depth of meaning of this is so often overlooked. You have to realize that this is what God wants for you, to live in the new covenant. Jesus said, Behold, I have made all things new. A new covenant, a better covenant, based on better promises. You'll find that in Hebrews 8, 6, and 7. And as much as the Old Testament is the word of God, you need to know, therefore, how to read it. It is the word of God, but it is a history book. It is pre-New Covenant. Yes, the books of the prophets foretell of Jesus, and there are many specific principles in the Old Covenant that we must know. But it must be divided into two basic parts. The law, which is dead, and then the promise that God made to Abraham, which is eternal and belongs to us today. And as the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus, go back to Galatians 3, 16 through 20, we are the ones who receive that promise. That's for the church today. God said through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed, not through Israel, but the church of Christ. So live in the new covenant and in the word of Jesus only. And remember, the better you know the word, the better you know God. Amen.